Today, we'll hear from Kathy Gents, the author of Ground Cover Revolution. She is the editor and publisher of Washington Gardener Magazine. A lifelong gardener, Kathy believes that growing plants should be stress-free and enjoyable. Her philosophy is inspiration over perspiration. Please welcome Kathy Jens. Thank you, Emma. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm gonna share screen now and bring up my PowerPoint. Let's get that from the beginning. There we go. So everybody should be seeing the great ground covers cover and wonderful to have you all on this Thursday afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. I see we're from all over and I think maybe even some Canadians. That would be great to have you join us. And as far as uh, the indigenous uh, natives who were where I am in Washington, D.C., I think it's mainly the Patuxent um, nation who was in my area originally. So I have to acknowledge them as well. And again, uh, thank you for joining me. I'm, as you said, Kathy Gents. I have recently published a book on ground covers called Ground Cover Revolution. It is a book that is being published internationally. And so um, one of the notes I have in my talk today is I'm going to cover some North American natives specifically, but if you look in the book, it's going to say country of origin, since somebody could be reading it in South Africa or in England or in Japan. Um, so native to them is relative, right? So you're not going to see the term native in the book. You're going to see a uh, country of origin and be able to narrow your choices if you're interested in just pure native ground covers to those. All right, so this is the first of our two-part Transforming Lawn series with Green America, and I wanna dive right in because we don't have that much time together and I have a lot to cover. Um, so first, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I think many of us know why we want ground covers, but I'm gonna go over really quickly some of the challenges and benefits that ground covers can address. Um, and so the first one that most people come to once they have some land that they are maintaining, um, maybe around their home or helping out somebody else is weed suppression. Usually they're looking for something low maintenance, something easier to maintain that they're not constantly having to pull weeds around. Um, and then they come to the next step, which is replacing turf grass. Either they have come to that because of environmental concerns, they wanna use um, less, gas, they don't want to be um, impacting the environment by creating a monocrop of turf grass everywhere, or they are just tired of mowing. I run into a lot of those people who are like, I have better times to do with my uh, life every week besides mowing in the summer heat or maintaining a turf grass lawn that I don't even use. Um, and I'm not going to stigmatize turf grass as say it's horrible and evil. There are purposes and occasions in your landscape where you would want a turf grass lawn. And that might be if you have uh, a kid who is in a soccer league and you want to practice kicking that ball around, then turf grass um, is great for that. If you have maybe pets that you want to exercise on your lawn, then maybe turf grass is the better alternative for that. But those are different phases in our life, right? And then after that phase is done, maybe that child grows up and is no longer playing soccer then we might want to replace that part of our landscape or at least reduce uh, the amount of turf grass lawn we have. Uh, next is absorbing storm water. So uh, we want to keep as much water on site in our landscape as possible so it's not flowing over it, going straight into our gutters and out to uh, the rivers and the ocean. Uh, we can keep that on site by plants that absorb and hold it in their roots. Um, so turf grass has been shown to do a little bit of that stormwater absorption, but in comparison to perennials and ground covers, uh, it's not even close. So you want trees, shrubs, perennials, ground covers are much better alternative for absorbing and holding that stormwater on site than slowly releasing it back uh, into the soil. And then if you have the situations of deep shade or full sun, it might be hard for you to maintain a turf grass lawn. So ground covers could be a great solution for either of those tough uh, growing situations. And then as a living or green mulch. Uh, so that's what I'm showing in this photo here with the Mexican 
feather grass or stipa um, surrounding this river birch. So they're filling in around it. They still have a little bit of mulch right around the tree trunk, but as the Mexican feather grass fills in, they will not have to reapply mulch in the spring and fall every year. The plants will form a living green mulch. And that's really what you want in your landscape is a living green mulch covering every bare surface of soil. Um, and that will keep in the soil, that will redu reduce weeds, that will hold the moisture in and um, not let the soil erode as well. And you won't have to be hauling in bags of mulch or having mulch delivered uh, twice a year or applied by professionals on your landscape. And then finally, a lot of people want um, ground covers because they want wildlife benefit. They want something that might be flowering for the pollinators or fruiting for our birds. So they want something a little bit more uh, wildflower, wildlife benefit than just straight turf grass. So some of the things that turf uh, can be hard to grow in that ground covers can address are if you have heavy clay soils, if you have compacted soils, if you have really tough tree roots that are right at the surface, those are gonna be situations where a turf grass lawn is near impossible to grow, but that ground covers can really uh, succeed in. If you are battling invasive plants, then ground covers can be a great choice to combat and replace the space where those invasive plants are coming in your landscape. And I have a couple of favorite ground covers that even beat out English ivy. So you see that in this situation here, the English ivy is creeping in. And I'll give you some um, ground covers that you can plant among English ivy that can take over it um, and suppress it. And next, if you have steep terrain. Now, it is very dangerous and not very fun to mow grass on a steep incline. Uh, you could lose a toe or a foot that way. Uh, so nobody likes to do that or maintain um, plantings on a steep hillside. So that's a great place to put ground covers is on a hill or slope or any steep terrain that you're not having to access and weed and water and fertilize all the time. And then finally, to create beauty right? Ground covers can be just beautiful. And I'm going to show you some kind of inspirational photos in this um, PowerPoint slideshow to get you started on your ground cover journey. All right, so my first set, and I've divided this up into um, several types of ground covers. I've grouped them up, and our first grouping is turf grass lawn substitutes. And this is especially the session section of the talk that addresses people who live in a homeowners association where they are mandated to have a green front lawn. Um, and they might not say turf grass, but it has to be low, it has to be maintained at a certain height, and it has to be green most of the time. Or they live in a county, state, municipality, city that has some of those similar um, archaic rules to that. So I'm going to give you some substitutes if you have that situation. Um, so let's go into uh, the first uh, turf grass substitute that I recommend is white clover. You can have other types of clover. There are native clovers to North America. There are imported clovers. This one I'm showing you, white clover is not native, but it has naturalized in a lot of the US. Um, and white clover used to be part of our lawn blends. So if you know the, the history of the American lawn up till about the 1950s, your lawn seed mix included white clover. And then herbicides and pesticides were introduced to the market that killed plants and they left the tall, thin grasses. Um, so then they had to demonize the broadleaf plants in the mix and say that they were weeds uh, because that's what the pesticides were killing. And that included white clover, plantain, dandelions, those and wild violets. Um, so those were now termed as weeds and taken out of the grass seed mixes. Lately, white clover has gotten a, a resurgence and more and more seed is available. You can find it at farmer supply stores. You can find it from seed companies. Um, there are places like Ecolon where they're selling seed packs of just micro clover or the red clover. Um, so I love it as a lawn substitute in a sunny area that's going to get a lot of foot traffic. 
um, can take a lot of step ability, great for pollinators. Bees just love those little clover heads and great for our little bunnies um, who would much rather be eating your turf grass, uh, your white clover than the turf grass or the rest of your landscape. And I was just gonna say that usually people um, say at this point, they're a little nervous about having a white clover lawn because they have kids who might be barefoot on it or pets that might get stung by a bee, um, in which case I would say, um, have as much as you can for the pollinators. But in the area where you might be stepping a lot, um, you might have an other alternative ground cover choice, or you might try micro clover, which has only 10% of the flowers of the white clover. Um, so it's just flowers much more sporadically, but still has a great clover benefit. All right, so let's go on to our next uh, turf grass substitute. And this is the Carex wood sedge or Carex woodii. And this is a um, North American native sedge. I'm going to give you some other sedges in this talk that are non-natives or hybrids of a native or an Asian species. But this one in particular, the native wood sedge um, was just uh, given the highest rating in the Mount Cuba Center trial of Carex's to be used for lawn substitutes. Um, so they rated all the native Carex cultivars available and straight species available. And this is Mount Cuba Center in Hocuson, Delaware. And you can look up their um, Carex trials at mountcubacenter.org. Um, that's free to download and look at their comparison trials. And part of their trial was mowing over the Carex and seeing how it bounced back. And the woody eye, the wood sedge, bounced back from weekly mowings. So if you were going to maintain a mowed lawn and didn't want turf grass, you can use this Carex or sedge for that purpose. You can also not mow it. So it just makes these nice, beautiful mounds. They knit together um, and cover the surface and they are fairly drought resistant once established. Carex is also deer resistant and rabbit resistant and stays fairly evergreen all year round. So next um, are the mosses. And I just love a beautiful moss lawn. And where moss is succeeding in your landscape, I would encourage you to let it succeed and expand on it. So you could take um, moss from one part of your landscape and add it to another part where see where they're making a family of mosses in this right hand corner. Um, so we want to ethically source our moss, of course. So there are a few sources I have in the book um, that I tell you about. We don't want to be taking mosses, of course, from our um, wild parks and other areas, but you can rehome some mosses in urban areas that might be growing on a rooftop or in a sidewalk cr crack and use those. So there are mosses that like sun. There are mosses that like it more dry. There are mosses that like it more wet. There are clumping mosses and there are creeping and expanding mosses. So you need to know what type of moss you're using, but a beautiful moss lawn um, is the greenest thing in my landscape in uh, the winter time and early springtime is just beautiful. Next are the creeping rosemary and creeping thyme. So these are the same as the Mediterranean herbs. Um, that you might be growing and using for culinary use in your kitchen. And yes, you can take a clipping and use those for eating. Um, maybe pick, take a section that you're not stepping on too much. Um, so creeping rosemary and creeping thyme, just like they sound, they are low growing carpet spreading herbs. And you get these beautiful pink flowers, especially on the creeping thyme. And sometimes you'll see it used um, named carpet thyme or um, sometimes fairy thyme or small leaf thyme and rosemary, they'll have other names for it, but basically it's the creeping rosemary and creeping thyme. If they release a beautiful herbal scent when you step on them, um, they can take a bit of foot traffic, they need great drainage and they do need full sun, but they are also wonderful on slopes and hilly areas. Um, so a good um, substitute for turf grass in those situations. And the pollinators, of course, love creeping rosemary when it's in flower as well. And then next are the stone crops or the sedums. So these are your very low growing creeping sedums. 
um, as opposed to those tall sedums that bloom in late summertime. And let me take a sip of water. So there are native sedums and non-native sedums and then cultivars and crosses in between. So if you want a native only garden, you might go for sedum ternatum um, is a beautiful low growing ground cover sedum for North America. Then we have hybrids like this one in the middle, this um, creeping mound expands slowly as mound. And then in the upper right, I'm showing you Angelonia or sometimes called Angelina. And that's a beautiful creeping spreading stone crop. Um, likes, like similarly to the creeping rosemary and thyme, they like good drainage. Um, they like a site that is um, generally full sun, but can go into part sun. Um, and another thing I love about the sedums is it's super easy to propagate them by just breaking off a piece. So any of these pieces that's creeping out onto the brick sidewalk here, you can just snap that piece off, kind of rough it up in your hand to break it into pieces and throw it under a shrub. And wherever it's contacting bare soil, it will root itself and take off. So that's what's so great about the stone crops or sedums is you can start with a few plugs and pieces and quickly have a nice full ground cover. All right, the next uh, one in this category is dwarf comfrey. This is opposed to the tall comfrey that you might be familiar with in your herb gardens. Um, this still has the same herbal uses, still great for your soil and your compost pile, great for making compost tea, great for the pollinators who love those flowers on comfrey, but this is more knee height versus the classic comfrey, which is waist height or so. And where I recommend the dwarf comfrey is in the situation I'm showing on the right here, which is under um, your fruit trees and your berry bushes. Um, so this is where you're not gonna step as much, but you want a thick green ground cover that fills in quickly and you can mow it back a couple times a year and leave the foliage and stems where they are chopped up on the ground. They will add back into the ground nutrients and then they will, the plants will grow back up again. You can usually do that mow back about two to three times a season. All right, so next section I'm gonna go through really quickly is on the perennial foliage choices. Um, so these are more what you think about as your classic ground covers. And in this picture right here, I'm just showing ribbons of hostas coming down a hillside. Um, and yes, before you ask, they do have a deer fence <laughs> around this section. So um, one of the ground covers that I love, it's a classic perennial, is hellebores. It's blooming right now in late winter and early spring. And it's a great ground cover um, for colonizing and round tree roots where especially hard to get a uh, hold of the soil amongst the tree roots. Hellebores are good for filling in there, as I'm showing in this picture here. They're also good under deciduous trees because when the leaves drop um, from the trees, the foliage of the hellebores cover the leaves, the leaves decay underneath, add back into the soil, and then um, are able to add nutrients back into the soil there. So it's an attribute that I call in the book leaf swallowing. So I have some charts in the book that show you the benefits of each ground cover and which has what, which is deer resistant, which is drought tolerant. And then I added a category called leaf swallowing. So if you have a lot of deciduous trees on a small lot, um, look into some of the more leaf swallowing um, type of ground covers. And this one is also deer resistant as well. So that makes it uh, very popular as a ground cover choice for that. So I showed you earlier the Carex woodii. This is a Carex hybrid card called Morowai or Ice Dance. And I'm just giving this as one of the many alternatives to Carex available on the market. Um, looks like grass. This is a close up of its strappy leaves. Feels like grass, but a little bit sharper on the edges. Um, so I'm just using this as a substitute for any of the many Carexes you can use for a lawn. Great for hillsides, uh, just like the Carex woody eye, deer resistant, um, evergreen for most of the year, and really tough, tough plant. All right, so this is one of my uh, favorites called Cranesbill geranium, and this is not the same geranium as the zonal geraniums that you buy that are red flowers um, and you would put in a window box in the summertime. So this is our hardy geranium macrorhizum. Macro meaning big, rhizome meaning root. 
So underneath this clump of geranium macorrhizum, there's a huge root running underneath. It's the size of like a human thigh or a baseball bat. And all you need is a little section of that root system in order to propagate this um, geranium. So it pops up with these beautiful, uh, very spicy scented leaves. They're about the size of a silver dollar. And then these little quarter sized flowers pop up in late springtime and then sporadically reflower all throughout the summertime makes a really thick mat and it's one of the ones that I recommend for combating against invasive plants um, like English ivy to cover those geranium macorrhizum is really good at filling in in part shade areas tough areas where there's not as much sun or not as much um, rain getting to uh, like under the eaves of the house like I have um, the geranium picture all right so next is the epimediums. So there are many, many epimediums out there. The most common epimediums on the market is rubrum, which is a pink flowering epimedium, and sulfurium, which is a yellow flowering epimedium. And those are your least expensive epimediums and the ones that are going to generally spread quickest for you. Uh, there are also collector epimediums that can get into the hundreds of dollars per little plant. That's not the epimedium you want for a ground cover. Those are little special collector rock garden plants. You want the fast spreading uh, common epimediums for that purpose. And so I love epimedium because it's also known as Bips hat or fairy hat. You get these beautiful little flowers in springtime and these long heart-shaped leaves for the rest of the season. They turn a beautiful bronzy burgundy in the fall winter time. And this is one of the ones that I talked about earlier that can overrun English ivy. I took a few plugs of small epimedium plants and planted them in the midst of an English ivy uh, patch to see if they could fight it out. And not only did the epimedium thrive, but it actually expanded and took over here this entire English ivy patch, which I was like amazed that this plant could do that because it looks so delicate, right, um, from the outside. So I'm a big fan of epimedium, it has great pollinator benefits as well. It's one of our earlier blooming ground covers, uh, but is not a North American native. So I do want to note that. All right. So Lily of the Valley um, is invasive in some areas and some areas it behaves perfectly fine. And where I'm gonna tell you never to plant it is in the middle of your sunny perennial flower bed. If you took a little pip or plug of this Lily of the Valley and pop that amongst your other perennials in a year or two, you are not gonna have anything but Lily of the Valley in that bed. So where I am telling you to plant Lily of the Valley is if you have a super tough situation in your landscape where you want to hold in the soil and nothing else will live there. And I'm thinking about situations like under your deck uh, where the sunlight is not really getting to it, where rain is not really getting into it, maybe in back of a shed or maybe in a little um, trough area under a fence or edging. Um, where nothing else is surviving for you, that's where you get a little pl couple plugs or pips. They, they're sold as pips, the little roots of the Lily the Valley, and you can plug those in um, and then maintain a little patch, thick patch, like I have under the uh, side of my house here, and it will be bordered in and can't expand from where it is there. So a really good, tough problem solver. So the next two are some sunny, uh, area ground covers. So these are thick leaved, fuzzy leaved ground covers that form a thick patch on the ground and then send up a tall flower spike. And the, the butterflies and bees love Lamsey or Stachys. Um, it is a plant, again, that needs full sun and good drainage. And it's deer resistant because of that fuzzy leaf texture, which the deer hate. And similar to the Lamsier or Stachys is Rose Campion. Uh, the difference being Rose Campion sends up one flower spike and at the top you'll have this lipstick pink. Sometimes it'll come in white um, little flower at the top. And then their foliage is in rosettes, little rounds, and that seeds around the place. Whereas I'm going to go back to Lamsier and show you that spreads around by underground roots and makes a thick covering of the surface. 
um, Rose Campion just has specific little rosettes that you can fill in um, and reseed to make a patch and solid one there. Both deer resistant, um, both beautiful flowers, both great pollinator benefits. Now, I'm gonna quickly talk about Liriope only because I want you to learn a little Latin in today's talk. So Liriope spicata is considered invasive in many areas of the United States because it is the running Liriope. So spicata takes off like a runner um, and spreads by roots. And once you have it in your landscape, it is very hard to dig out and remove. That is versus the Liriope muscari, which is the clumping Liriope. And that's what I'm showing in the photo here. So it clumps, slowly expands as a clump. Then you could dig it after a few years, divide it, add a clump somewhere else. So that's the difference. So I want you to know if you are going to purchase a Liriope, the differences between the clumping and the running. And the only um, real situation where I'm even recommending the clumping Liriope is if you do have a steep hillside that you want to maintain and get something in there with roots that will hold it down quickly, that might be where you might use the Liriope muscari in that situation. It's a very tough plant, um, can take a lot of different sun to shade situations, and can take a lot of different soils, can also take a drought pretty well. All right, and then I wanted to compare the Liriope to Mondo grass, and a lot of people mistake the two and use them interchangeably, but the Latin name for Mondo grass is Othopogon, so totally different plant, totally different genus, totally different. Um, so the, some people will call either Liriope or Mondo grass, monkey grass, um, but again, different plants. And what I'm showing here is a townhouse front yard and they're using the low clumping uh, mounding Mondo grass at the front here along the steps, very steppable, tough plant, bounces back, looks just like a lawn. And then to the back of that, they're using a bed of the black Mondo grass, the black Othopogon as kind of an accent to the back of that. Um, they could have used all black mondo grass or they could have used all the low growing um, mondo grass and not done the two different textures, but I really love how they blended the two different mondo grasses there in that situation. So something to think about for ground cover design, um, combining a kind of higher with a kind of lower closer to your walkway is an interesting effect and a really nice one to do. All right, so next we have ajuga, bugleweed. Again, this is considered uh, invasive in some parts of North America and other parts, it's perfectly fine. So again, right plant, right place, know your local um, plant lists. And it is a overground spreader, very shallow rooted, very easy to pull up where you don't want it. And I'm showing it here going across pebbles just to show you the stolen and the roots as they're spreading across the ground. Then it touches in, forms a clump, spreads again, touches in, forms a clump, and that's how it makes a thick bed, as I'm showing here under this crepe myrtle. There are new um, ajugas on the market that are in different variegated colors and even orange reds being introduced. So just want you to know that there's the classic green, but there's also the toffee chip one I'm showing here and a chocolate chip and some of the newer colors. And then lamium. So this one is also called dead nettle. This is one like the lily of the valley that I'm only recommending in your toughest spots, like under shrubs here, under this azalea, in shade, in moist shade, where nothing else is able to establish for yourself, then you might wanna try out lamium, but it is a aggressive runner. Um, so you do wanna pin it in or have it against a walkway or a wall to make sure it doesn't escape from the area you have it in. And that's one of the good things and bad things right about ground covers is ground covers are spreaders and they fill in an area, but then they're also fast spreaders that fill in an area. So you will have to do some maintenance to keep them in check after that they've filled in uh, where you want them to be. Similarly to the creeping Jenny or Lysimachia that can have um, similar applications to the ajuga and the lamium that I just showed you, but good for tough, tough situations or situations that go from full sun to full shade, like under a shrub or edging 
um, where another ground cover that only likes shade or one that only likes sun wouldn't be able to bridge those two areas. And then finally, um, in the book, I do talk about some edible ground covers. And uh, one of my favorite ground covers to use that's edible is the strawberry family. So we do have native North American strawberries. Um, there are also strawberries in European and Asian um, and cultivars. And I'm showing here a normal cultivar for the agricultural trade being used as a front edge of a border. And so strawberries, if you've ever grown them, spread by runners, similar to what I showed you with the ajuga and the lamium, and then they root at the runners. You can cut them off at the runner and move them around to where you'd like them. There is a cultivar in particular that is used commonly as a ground cover, and that's pink panda, um, is the one you'll see in the nursery trade. And that one has big pink flowers and it does create fruit that is edible. Um, so there are strawberries that are native that are, they're edible, but they're not as palatable, right? Um, and then there's some beautiful wild strawberries that we have that are great um, as edibles. And then there are, of course, the cultivated agricultural ones that I'm showing here. But Pink Panda in particular was bred as a ground cover, great on the sunny slope, great if you want to get a few berries, you might have to beat the birds and the other creatures to them. All right, and then mending with hostas, just because hosta is such a tough plant and a lot of people have it in their landscape and want to know how to use it. And I thought this was a perfect usage of the old fashioned straight hosta plantain lily. Um, and in this grouping around a small tree where you can maintain it, you wouldn't have to mow it and you don't have to use a weed whacker around the base of this tree. Um, and then it just dies back in the winter time and pops back in the spring. Super easy, no maintenance, um, little planting circle right there. All right, so this next section, I'm just gonna do a quick time check. Yay, perfect on time, is our North American natives. Oh. And this um, is a beautiful patch about 100 yards long and 20 yards wide. Um, under these deciduous trees. And this is our native Tiarella and Hucarella. Um, and this was in downtown Pittsburgh. So this is one tough plant in a downtown park that was getting a bit of foot traffic, even though I probably wouldn't step in there, but you know, occasionally you're tossing a ball around and a ball might land in the middle. So you could still jump in there and grab it. So I talked to you earlier about Carex woodii and the Carex ice dance, one of the cultivars that's available on the market. This is our Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica. And this one is becoming super popular as a native ground cover. Um, this Carex, as opposed to the other ones I showed you, has a much finer, thinner blade to it. Um, you can run your fingers through it, not as sharp as the or as large as the other ones. And what's great about it is the wind moves through it and it looks like waves of grain. It just has this beautiful like sea foam look to it when the wind moves um, the foliage. And this is looking straight down from the top of a slope. So I'm looking down almost 45 degrees down to the sidewalk. So this homeowner has planted Pennsylvania sedge in as a ground cover so they don't have to mow. Looks similar to grass, is not as mowable as the woody eye, which I showed you earlier. So in the Mount Cuba trials, they did mow the Pennsylvania, but it didn't bounce. And I'm going to recommend it as a not to mow sedge because I think it is just beautiful the way it is right there. You can plant bulbs among it. You can plant other wildflowers that would pop up in the season like this person is doing here. Or you can just have a straight ground cover of the beautiful Pennsylvania sedge. It's just gorgeous. And it keeps its kind of lime chartreuse color most of the season. All right, so next is our native Pacara aurea. Sometimes you'll see it under Senecio, uh, one of the older Latin names. So Pacara forms a really beautiful that's what I'm showing you on the left hand picture here. These kind of spade shape or heart shaped leaves crawl across the, the ground. And then in the middle of spring, it sends up these shoots of bright yellow flowers. Then the yellow flowers go to seed and make really attractive, um, bright 
seed heads that the birds will eat later on. And that's uh, also a part warning to you <laughs> that if you do not want the seeds to spread all around your landscape, you might cut them off before the birds get them. But if you are growing them for the wildlife and for the birds to enjoy, just know that you're gonna get some reseeding around if you let that the flowers go to seed. Um, so the rest of the year, you're just gonna have a beautiful, nice base foliage of this green uh, carpet and really tough plant that goes from part sun to part shade. And I would say, borderline deer resistant it all depends on your local deer population this one is being left alone where it is under heavy deer pressure but i think if the deer were hungry enough they would take a couple bites all right so next are our two of our native floxes and again this is the low growing floxes not the tall summer flox um, so the first one is flox stolonifera also known as carpet flocks or creeping flocks. So for most of the year, the flocks just looks like green moss mounding on the ground. And then in the early springtime, it is covered in beautiful early flowers. So we've got a lavender here with pink amongst it in this um, small front yard in urban location. It wants good drainage and as much sun as you can get it. Um, so it is where uh, natively, there would be a clearing in the woods or a stone outcropping. That's where you would find the Phlox stolonifera, as opposed to Phlox subulata. So this is the woodland Phlox, and it has this nice deep green foliage at the base that spreads like a carpet. And then it sends up these kind of tall flowers, I'm going to call it six to eight inches above versus the moss flocks, which has it right sitting on the surface. These are held up on little stems and it prefers shade and prefers a little more moisture. So you'll see it here under this um, big area of azaleas at the US National Arboretum and forming a beautiful understory carpet. So two different situations. This would be a woodland situation flocks, your flocks subulata, and this would be a sunny, um, open area situation, your flock stolonifera. Two great choices, two different native flocks. And then ferns. So there are ferns on pretty much every continent on this planet. And there are native ferns, there are imported ferns, there are a lot of fern crosses, but there are probably some great fern choices wherever you are joining me from today. I particularly love Christmas fern. Uh, because it is evergreen in the wintertime. Uh, some ferns die back to the ground and then send out new fronds every year. Um, others are deciduous or um, keeping and evergreen, so it depends on what you want. And I love the ostrich fern that's in the lower right here. It has, it's a taller fern, um, but fills in very thickly and aggressively and um, fills in really nicely in shady, moist areas. But there are also some ferns that like it a little more dry, um, like the cinnamon fern and some of the wood ferns. So just check out some of those ferns that are uh, native to your area. And Quaker ladies. So some people know this by the common name bluette, like the color blue, um, but the um, common name uh, Quaker ladies is where I, what I mostly hear it as. It's a very, very pale blue, almost white. Um, it spreads in a carpet similar to clovers, but unlike the clovers, which prefer sunny, well-drained areas, the Houstonia uh, like a little bit more damp. So areas around a stream bed or like a ditch or a gully would be perfect, or maybe meadows where it sits kind of in wet. That's a great place for seeding in the, the Quaker ladies and having a beautiful bed of that blooming in the spring and summer, like I'm showing on the right side. And then we have our native Pachysandra. So this is Allegheny Spurge, as opposed to the Japanese Pachysandra or Asian Pachysandra. So if you've grown the Asian Pachysandra, it has a shiny leaf, a little white flower, and it probably spreads prolifically for you. But our native Pachysandra has kind of a um, matte leaf and a little white flower too in season, great for wildlife. Um, but here's the catch with our native Pachysandra. 
it is very slow to fill in an area. So this area of about three by five feet that I'm showing here, if I started off with like six or seven plugs, would probably take three to five years at least to get coverage. Um, in the meantime, you're going to have to be weeding or mulching while you're waiting for the native pachysander to fill in. Um, so great plant, great for leaf swallowing. So here I show it under a tulip poplar swallowing the, that foliage and the drop petals. So great also, similar to where I talked about the hellebore being great for leaf swallowing. Um, great under deciduous trees and amongst their roots. Um, really good for establishing a bed there. But again, can be a little expensive to get the plugs and expensive to get a lot of coverage quickly with the native pachysander, but worth it in the end because this is a gorgeous and um, beautiful native ground cover choice. All right, so another uh, great native ground cover, Chrysogonum virginiana or green and gold, forms a low carpet and spreads. Um, this likes a little bit more shade in the woodland, but wants some sun, doesn't want to be in deep shade. And when you get some sun, you get these beautiful yellow flowers. To me, it looks a lot like a native strawberry if the native strawberry had yellow flowers to it. So very um, nice little ground cover that can go under the edge of shrubs where it's peeking out in part sun or part shade. And then we have all the Rudbeckias, our Black Eyed Susans. And similar to what I talked about in the perennial section where I talked about the lambs ear forming a carpet at ground level and then sending up flowers. Same thing with Black Eyed Susan. It forms that nice thick carpet that chokes out weeds and then sends out the beautiful flowers, which are pollinators and wildlife love. And then you leave the seed heads up for the birds in the winter time. So there are many, many different um, native Rebecca that you can choose from. There's also a lot of new cultivars on the market. But I like our straight um, Rebecca Herda. I think it's a, a great choice, especially for those on the East Coast here. And then and our uh, one of our last natives I wanted to share is one of my favorites, Anteria. Uh, and it's known by the common name Pussy Toes because the flower looks like a little kitten paw. So that's your little kitten paw on the left. And it spreads, again, along the ground, kind of looks like moss, but or kind of a sedum moss, moss mix. And then it sends up these fun uh, flower spikes in the early summertime. And this is a funny woodland plant because people will plant this in the shade thinking it's a woodland shade plant. It is a woodland sun plant. It wants to be in those clearings where the sun hits between trees. So think about those situations. That's my little alarm for myself. Um, for your ground covers where you have breaks in between shrubs, where sunlight is beating down, it can take a lot more sun than you think it can. And then these are the wild violets that are native here. So we have our Confederate violets and lots of different um, native violets, wood violets in our area. And I like to take violets wherever they're popping up in my vegetable plot or anywhere else in the landscape and put them in my violet pathway. And so I make a nice violet bed along it. And this is my little violet pathway and violets are edible for you. You can eat the tender leaves, you can eat the flowers and use those in culinary purposes. Uh, but they are loved by the fritillary butterfly family, especially. They are great for our early uh, pollinators because they're starting to bloom now in early spring and will bloom sporadically throughout the season. Just a great ground cover choice. I know they've been demonized like our clovers as broadleaf weeds, um, but there's nothing wrong with wild violets in the right place in your landscape. And here I have them um, very steppable, can take a lot of foot traffic, and bounce right back. So I'm um, going to give you one more ground cover in our last few minutes that we have together that I just love, and that's our native ginger, um, and that is the canadensis. So Acerum canadensis from Canada, but it's throughout the entire eastern U.S. There's also a western U.S. version of the wild ginger, um, loves really damp shade situations. So where moss might proliferate, wild ginger is going to really love it there as well. So it sends up this kind of 
um, spade shaped foliage comes straight up in the early spring and then lays down and makes this thick carpet here that I'm showing next to this vernal pool. And then underneath that foliage, if you pick it up and look underneath in the early springtime, you're going to see these tiny little flowers just so adorable laying along the ground, along the ground. And those are pollinated by beetles and flies. So that is a hint that they are not the best smelling flowers in your landscape, uh, but they are so cool to look at and to photograph and, and show your kids or grandkids or any visitors in your garden. Um, so it gets the name wild ginger uh, because the root can be used in culinary purposes and has a gingery type um, taste to it, but it is not related at all to the Asian ginger. So it's just called that for its common name. So just wanna make that clear. Um, and then we have all the hookeras. I showed you the Tiarella at the beginning. The hookeras are a great ground cover. You especially want to look for hookera villosa, V-I-L-O-O-S-A in the Latin name. That is the hairy leafed hookera. The hairy leaf hookera has a kind of texture to the leaf that the deer do not find palatable. It also is a tougher plant for those of us um, who have hot and humid summers. Um, and if you're in the Pacific Northwest, uh, you have a broader range of hookera that you can be using there. But for those of us in the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast US, we definitely want to look for the hookera villosa as a great ground cover in our region. And there are beautiful colors available. We've got the um, sweet tea and palace purple here. There's chartreuse versions. There's almost metallic silvers and blacks. Just incredible wardrobe of colors available in hookahs. And I can't say enough about how beautiful hookah is as a ground cover. And then this is the end of my native plant section. And since we only have a few minutes left, this is what I call my security ground cover. So the ground cover you put where you don't want anybody to step, right? Um, this is our native cactus Opuntia prickly pear. So there are Opuntia, Opuntia species that are native to the East Coast. There are natives to the Western United States and native to the Southwest. So there is basically an Opuntia that is native to each region of the Americas. Um, so they all produce this beautiful yellow flower spike in the summertime that turns to the prickly pear fruit. If you handle the paddle or the fruit or any part of prickly pear, please wear leather gloves. Um, you don't want even those little tiny hairs on it to get into your um, skin. They have little tiny barbs that you might not even see on the fruit. Um, you might also know it by the name of Nopalis. So used in culinary uses in Central and South America. Um, yes, and you can eat the prickly pear, but the wildlife uh, love it too. And the pollinators, I just have bumblebees all over my prickly pear. Um, and to propagate it, you just snap off one of these paddles, again, wearing leather gloves, and place it on bare soil. And they kind of root themselves just like a lot of other sedums or cactuses will do. So a really, really fun, prolific growing one in the winter time when it's cold they kind of just lay down flat and kind of look like deflated balloons then when it warms up again they just plump up again um, and look as beautiful as this patch right here so um, in our last few minutes I'm going to give us time for Q&A and I'm going to stop the share there and then I'm going to come back with a slide with some resources um, so Emma or Brooke, if you want to read me some of the questions in the chat while I do that. Yes, absolutely. Um, this was this was such a popular webinar, Kathy, that we even had questions coming in the last few days before it started. Oh, okay, <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. Uh, could you share some tips on transforming a lawn planted on soil that has very high, uh, very high clay content uh, and is on a significant slope? The grass is, this person shared, the grass seems to be keeping the clay from washing away. Mm -hmm. So uh, should they just keep the grass or do you have some suggestions for replacing it with another ground cover? Yeah, so in that case, um where you got tough clay soils. You can use one of the Carex's I showed you. They're, they're pretty clay resistant. 
um, and have pretty thick roots. Um, if you're not looking for native only, if you're open to non-native, uh, a shrubby ground cover that I love is winter jasmine because um, that tips into the soil and grabs hold, makes new roots, and wherever it sends out a shoot, it tips in and grabs again. So it's great on a steep slope or bank for holding in the soil that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Teresa E. shared that they have several trees in their backyard and it becomes covered with leaves in the fall. Do they leave the leaves or is there uh, on a on not a grass lawn on a on a non traditional ground cover lawn? So do they leave the leaves there or is it better to round them up? So yeah, it depends on the ground cover. So if it's a ground cover like moss. You can leave the leaves for a couple days, but you do want to blow or rake those off and chop them up and add them into a bed, maybe, or compost them. So that can suffocate a turf grass lawn or a moss lawn. But like the leaf swallowing ones that I indicated, like our native Pachysandra, like the hellebores, the um, geranium macrorhizum, the hardy geraniums those can take leaves falling into them, kind of consume those leaves and they will decay amongst them. So that those are okay to leave. So it just depends on your ground cover, um, what you have. Um, because a thick covering of leaves, it, like if it was magnolia leaves, that's gonna smother anything, right? <laughs> but if it's the more fine oak leaves or maple leaves, those might break up and decay a little quicker for you. Um, and before we go to the next question, I was just pointing out this slide um, is on some ground cover resources. A few of them that I have listed here are wholesale only, um, but they would sell to you if you were to get a group together of like, say, it could be your garden club or your neighborhood association um, and put together a group order. They would, um, you know, do something in quantity like that for some of the ground cover sources I'm showing there. And then that's my contact information. Uh, um, Washington Gardener Magazine is a Green America Gold Certified Business. Yay! And I think it's been 10 years now or so that we've been in Oh, that incredible. Service. So I'm happy about that. Our blog is washingtongardener.blogspot.com. You can find me on social media at WDC Gardener on Instagram, Pinterest, and um, Twitter, and also TikTok as well. Facebook, you can find me under my name and also Washington Gardener Magazine. And for those who might have joined later, I am Washington, D.C. area as opposed to Washington State, uh, though we all we are very similar growing zones, six, seven, similar climates. But I'm on the, the right coast and they're on the left coast. So I just want to make that clear. And I do have a weekly podcast called Garden D.C. that is free and available to anybody anywhere to listen to. You can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, et cetera. And we had um, an episode about four weeks back called Ground Covers versus Ground Covers. And that might be uh, the podcast episode that a lot of you all who are watching right now might want to listen to because I am interviewing another author. So I have my new ground cover book and he had a ground ground cover book that came out about six months ago and his ground cover book and he's based in Canada. So we compare and contrast our um, different takes on ground covers and our favorites. So that's really fun one to listen to, especially if you're really interested in learning more about ground covers. And then of course we have my new book, Ground Cover Revolution. And last year I co-wrote a book on urban and small space gardening with Terry Spate. Um, and that one is a lot about small space gardening solutions for those who are growing in like townhouse, patio, rooftop, um, or just small landscapes in general. And I'm gonna let that go back to stop the share so I can look at the chat too, Emma. <laughs> oh, I've, yeah. I've, I've been rounding up all the questions, Kathy, so you don't have Great. to. And I'm telling you right now, we won't have time for all of them, folks, because there are just so many. And yeah, and I could we can't be on for another extra. hour. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I could stay a few minutes extra to answer a few more. But I know that a lot of people who only had an hour out of their day or their lunch hour. Thank you for joining us and, and um, do watch the recording if you missed part of it. 
Um, Kathy, there were many, many questions about whether you had suggestions for ground covers that are good in high heat and drought areas. Mm -hmm. um, someone even wrote that they live in a place where it can reach as high as 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so some of the sedums and the opuntia are great choices for that. The creeping rosemary and thyme also can take um, pretty much almost desert conditions because remember they originate from the Mediterranean on those rocky hillsides where they're getting you know a rain once every long while wash over them and then just washes right off. Um, so you'll look into more of those. Um, in the book, I give the temperature ranges. So because it's an internationally published book, I don't say USDA zones, I say the actual temperature range for the plant. Um, so they could use that as a resource and they could also um, check the column I have for the drought tolerant varieties. Um, I also, when I mentioned that, also wanna say that I have our category for fire resistant um, because especially oh, wow. in our Western US states, right? That's more and more of a concern because you don't want to be putting in like a thick layer of ground cover that's just going to swoop, you know, bring that fire right up to your foundation. That would be crazy, right? Um, so there are some more resistant um, types of ground covers for firescaping, as they're calling it. And that's kind of a new um, research field in horticulture that people are looking into. So that's an evolving science right now. Neat. Thank you. Um, there were also many, many questions about uh, whether one needs to completely remove their grass first while they're transforming their lawn or if they can put seeds and whatnot directly in with it and the, the hopefully the ground covers will take over. Yeah, well, as people who are trying to establish turf grass lawns for years and fighting back the clover and the wild violets, <laughs> that sort of thing, they could, they could probably tell you, uh, just let it go. Um, is one way to do it. But what in the book, I describe a few different ways to establish new ground covers. Um, the hardest task in, in that would be sod busting, which is literally digging a section and then pu pu putting in new ground covers. So I usually tell people just to take back a section every year. Um, there are machines that you can rent that will sod bust for you, or you can do it by hand. There's also the lasagna or layer method that I described, which is basically layering newspapers with mulch to smother um, the, the turf grass underneath. And then the following season, you would plant back into there. Um, so there are different ways to get them established depending on the ground cover. But again, if you have a part of your turf grass that's turning over to strawberries, wild strawberries or turning more over to moss, then encourage that plant, maybe weed whack it super low, your turf grass lawn or mow it at its lowest setting. So you're knocking back the turf grass competition and letting that ground cover underneath emerge better. Right. Uh, do you have any suggestions for uh, where where everyone on this call can find a good place to get info on native ground covers, grass replacement, or mm -hmm. different regions. Is there someone locally they could speak to, or where could yeah, they, they find these different their, ground covers? Yeah. So in the book, I try to point out where everything is native to, and if a lot of the categories, like I talk, like I talked about with the ferns, there's native ferns and there's Asian ferns and there's European ferns. So you just have to know on the plant tags and stuff, and that could be where you're local native plant society comes in um, and also going to your local public gardens which might specialize in native plants um, so here in the mid-atlantic the adkins arboretum on the eastern shore of maryland that's one you can go and see native plant covers in situation there growing and can see what they look like same thing with mount cuba um, in Delaware that has patches of native ground covers. That's where I took that photo of those beautiful Quaker ladies in that field. I've had other great installations I've seen of the Houstonia or, or Quaker ladies, but never more beautiful than what I saw at Mount Cuba. Hey. That, that's what I was just gonna say that your local public gardens often will have classes on native plants and often will have uh, demonstrations areas planted. So check with your local 
gardens as well as your local plant native plant societies. All right, thank you. Um, are there any alternatives to turf grass that you can recommend for lively dogs? Dogs <laughs> with the zoomies. I like lively dogs as opposed to unlively dogs. <laughs> so yes, so um, a book I'm working on is gardening with pets. So that's one that's kind of on the back burner that I've been working on on the side for a while. And that's one of the things I want to address. And so micro clover is one that can take a lot of foot traffic and dog running across it and doesn't have as much flowering. Um, like I said, only 10% of the white clover. So that's a really good choice. Um, so a lot of the carexes, you know, once they're established and rooted, then you might let your dog run through. But when you're starting to establish a lot of the ground covers, that's the time you're like, oh, maybe don't run through there and, and disturb that area, right? Um, but I would say those are probably your best choices. Um, some of the tougher carexes and the mo even that low growing mondo grass I showed you in the townhouse um, landscape. I've seen people use those in dog runs um, and they've worked well, except, and here's the big exception, if your dog is a digger, right, then it's going to be tough to establish almost any ground cover if, you're, if your dog likes to dig. And in that case, it's good if you can give them an area, like a sandboxy type area, compost area, um, that that's where they're allowed to dig and then not in the rest of your land landscape if possible. But, you know, pets are pets, right? <laughs> Dogs are going to dog. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and perhaps, uh, perhaps one final question. Again, I'm uh, sorry to everyone. There's just, you all are so curious. There's just no way we can get to all of them. Uh, could oh, you- Somebody just put, we could hire the dogs to remove the turf. I like oh, that. that. Yeah, <laughs> great, great idea, Jay. <laughs> yes. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about transplanting mosses? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to recommend a book by a friend of mine, um, and her name is Annie Martin. And I believe it's like the, uh, the Art of Moss Gardening. I have to look up the exact title, but it's from Timber Press Books. It's really the only good moss gardening book on the market. Um, and I interviewed her on the podcast, so that's another good episode to look up so go to Garden DC and uh, I interviewed her in depth on establishing a moss garden and a moss lawn and she talks about the different ways to do that and she is based out of Asheville, North Carolina in the mountains there and her name is Mawson Annie and her company is Moss Acres so she does um do moss lawns and moss gardens for a living and does sell them, um, you know, ethically sourced mosses. So she's one of the ones I, I would trust as a good moss source. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Thank you to the nearly 300 of you who stayed on past the hour. Um, yeah, Kathy just put up a photo of her book. It's yeah, fabulous. So for that. Um, yeah, I've I went through it all. It's really wonderful. Um, I'll put my I'll keep my contact info up there for a little bit too for those who are who didn't grab that. All right, and uh, everyone will receive a follow up email with the recording, with resources from the chat, and information about Kathy's book as well as our uh, part two in this series. Uh, thank you, Kathy, so, so much for joining us. And uh, thank you to all who joined in today. Thank you all. <laughs>